The Cloudcast is sponsored by Intel Cloud for All, driving the creation of tens of thousands of clouds. Cloudcast Media presents from the massive studios in Raleigh, North Carolina. This is the Cloudcast with Aaron Delp and Brian Gracely, bringing you the best of cloud computing from around the world. Good morning, good evening, wherever you are. Welcome back to the Cloudcast, coming to you live, as always, from the massive Cloudcast studios here in Raleigh, North Carolina. Aaron, how are you doing tonight? I'm doing doing really well. So after, what, 240-ish episodes, we're trying something new, but only because we were forced to. Yeah, you're right. We, uh, we've got sort of end of one streak and a, and a continuation of another streak. So for like you said, the first time in two hundred and some odd episodes, we're not using Skype tonight. We're we actually had to switch over to Google Hangouts because Skype just would not behave. So, uh, apologies in advance if the audio quality is a little suboptimal for this show. We'll try and get it fixed for the next one. Uh, but the good news is we're we're still on the show together. We're we're both uh, recording. We're both in town and uh, keeping that streak alive. So we'll see how long that lasts. Yeah, I know. We were trying to figure out how long we could keep the streak going, and it seems like it's uh, just going and going now. So, Aaron, you know, before we get started, I got to ask you a question. Um, you know, we've been, uh, you know, big fans of the folks over at Intel. I've been sponsoring the show for quite a while now. We've got some good friends over there, Jonathan and uh, and Nick and and uh, Matthew, Brendan, and all of them. I was watching. They had an event today, and it left me scratching my head a little bit. Not so much the Intel part, but there was an announcement in there that uh, Mirantis and CoreOS. Uh, as well as Intel, we're, we're working together in this thing where they're they're trying to merge together OpenStack and Kubernetes. And I kind of I, I scratch my head. I couldn't quite figure it out. Um, the only you know they I, I can't figure out why they're trying to to merge you know what feel like two IaaS type of things. I mean I know one is sort of VM centric and one's container centric. But did you see this and this make any sense to you at all? Well. <sighs> No. Well, first of all, no. Um, but here's here's what I think is potentially going on is is it's almost like, you know, get a PaaS and an IaaS right next to each other, all under the same management platform. But the whole who's running on top of who and what's going on, it's a little bit like, you know, OpenStack with Rano and containers. And um, it, it's all just odd to me right now. <laughs> I don't know how else to put it. Um, it's just, it just seems like a... Um, the the cloud management platforms instead of getting lighter are getting a lot heavier, um, which is prob- probably a direct correlation into our guest tonight. <laughs> yeah, it left me, you know, like I said before, left me sort of confused. The only sort of rational explanation I heard for this, and, and again, hopefully some more details will come out, and uh, we'll see what how it, how it plays out. But uh, our friend Subu, who works over at uh, eBay, who was on a while ago talking about immutable infrastructure and infrastructure as code and stuff, sort of said, you know, they are actually considering running OpenStack on top of Kubernetes. Uh, and, and the way they think about that is uh, OpenStack then becomes an application and Kubernetes manages to scale it. And he said the reason was because OpenStack sort of struggles to, to you know, the, that organization, the foundation hasn't spent is nearly enough time kind of focusing on how to operationalize it and make it work. And, and they're going to use Kubernetes sort of expertise at keeping things up and running and so forth to uh, to keep OpenStack up. So it seems a little weird, but, uh, you know, seem, you know he's, he's using it as a practical way to, to deal with it. Interesting. Anyways, I throw that out there uh, partially as a you know just a piece of news that was out there that might be interesting to folks, uh, but but more so sort of to use it as a contrast for tonight. Um, so uh, a couple weeks ago we had Joe Emerson on. We were talking about serverless stuff and uh, kind of getting in some basic things. Um, the community as a whole gave us a ton of feedback. Really seemed to like the show, so we thought we would explore that a little bit. And uh, we've got a really really fun set of guests tonight. So let's just go ahead and get right to that. Uh, so tonight's guests are um, a couple of guys who have a really deep operational background, and we'll get into that. Um, but Aaron and I found them uh, through a new podcast that they're doing called Engineers and Coffee. So uh, Donnie Flood and Larry Ogrodnik, welcome to the show, guys. Thanks uh, thanks for coming on, and glad to have you. Yeah, thanks for having us. We're super excited yeah, to be here. Totally. Thanks for having us. So before we get into your guys' background, I got to talk a little bit. Uh, we we had a guest on oh, man, many years ago, uh, a guy named Peter Ulander, who was um, 
with a company that eventually got acquired by Citrix. But, uh, you know, his claim to fame, amongst many other things, was he owned the cloud.com domain. And uh, we always used to say he was the most interesting man in the cloud. You guys own the engineers.coffee domain. So you guys might be the uh, most interesting people in engineering. Uh, Super smart to grab that uh, domain and uh, kind of fun way to start the podcast. Yeah, can you believe it was available? (laughs) (laughs) So, you know, guys, give us a little bit of your background. I know, um, you know, we've heard a little bit through the podcast, but, you know, you, you know, currently, uh, you know, we're doing some things around LinkedIn. Um, LinkedIn acquired your company called Bezo or Bizo. Um, Give us a little bit of your background because it's it's pretty rich and um, it'll give us a sense of maybe why you guys uh, decided to to also start your podcast as well as some of the the cool work you're doing on a day-to-day basis. Sure. Do you want to start, Donnie? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, I'm happy to. Uh, so, yeah, before so before LinkedIn, um, you know, right immediately before that, I was working. You know, co-founded a company that Larry and I were working at called Bizzo, um, and was the CTO of that. So we, you know, we're lucky enough to to sort of start as a cloud native company back in 2008, and so grew up with AWS. Um, and uh, right before that, and so, you know, so that was about a you know eight year. Um, you know, company from beginning to exit. And then before that, I was an early employee at a company called AdMob, which is an early kind of mobile advertising company that uh, luckily got acquired by Google um, after I left, actually. I was there for a couple of years and, and then went to left, uh, to, went to, to find, found, found Bizzo. And um, so, yeah, that was kind of, you know, the last couple of companies. And before that, I was doing a lot of mobile stuff before mobile was, you know, was big time, um, you know, it was, Back when mobile every year was like, you know, the next year was going to be the year of mobile. But um, so yeah, that's a quick intro. Yeah, so that's how I met Donnie. Uh, so yeah, back in 2008, I, I previously to that, I was working in New York at a couple of different startups. And, you know, I always wanted to try living on the West Coast and um, got introduced to Donnie and Russ, uh, who was the CEO of Bizzo and flew out there and, you know, thought they were both super bright and was excited to, I don't know, get in super early and also... Um, you know, get started using AWS. I mean, I think, especially in 2008, there weren't a lot of companies that were, you know, all in an AWS on day one. Uh, you know, Bizzo never had any servers, not even any, you know, internal servers, nothing. Everything was on AWS from day one. And back in 2008, I think that was pretty early. There wasn't a whole lot there. You know, I remember, like, there wasn't even really, of course, it was an IAM. There weren't users. You know, the same account we used to buy books and snacks for the office was our root login to AWS, right? It's the way it was for everybody. <laughs> uh, sure. So, and, you know, we ended up, we built a couple of services internally, like early on, we built kind of an EMR clone because was, there was no EMR. We had no insight into the AWS development pipeline, right? And so we built this thing like... It was a proto, proto EMR. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> built this thing like 2008. And then, you know, later, like mid-2009, Amazon announces EMR. I'm like, oh no, why do we spend a month building that thing, you know? But yeah, I was just super excited to to work in, you know, kind of high volume um, stuff. And uh, yeah, it was a great experience. Cool. That's really cool. Now, no, so kind of we'll go into us finding you, right? We found the show really a, a tweet around Lambda originally. Um, and and that's something we've been both digging into pretty heavily here recently and, and talking to Cloud Guru folks. And, and really, we're just wondering, like, how did you get the start of the show? Was it intentionally to talk about Lambda or was Lambda just happened to be the first topic? Yeah, I think it just happened to be the first topic. I mean, it's something that, you know, we're both pretty excited about as... Um, you know, future direction in AWS. And I think just this kind of thing in general. And I don't know, before we started the show, I was joking with a friend, you know, about the kind of will it blend series of commercials. I don't know if you guys remember those with like Vitamix and they would throw like iPhones into a blender and, you know, or whatever. And it was just, you know, throwing crazy stuff into a blender, like will it blend with this, you know, super industrial blender. And we're joking around, it'd be cool to do something on like, will it Lambda? Just take, you know, a crazy idea could you possibly implement that without having any kind of, you know, traditional backend um, you know, serverless kind of setup? And so it was something we thought would be a good segment for the show and kind of started with that. But, um, you know, we've done a lot, some other stuff too, like other kind of just cloud industry news in general. And, you know, we're trying to even diversify a little bit, which, you know, is, is a good idea or not, because we're not as... Um, 
familiar with like the Microsoft Cloud and the Google Cloud, but we've been trying to talk about that a little more and, and get a little more educated on that too. Yeah, and I'll give you my little bit of my side of, of how this podcast started. So, you know, basically Larry's like, dude, we need to do we need to do a podcast. And I'm like, really a podcast? Like, I don't know, I don't know anything about podcasts. And he's like, yeah, but it's so easy. Let's just, you know, let's just record something and, and let's just try to get, you know, a month's worth of podcasting going. And and he's like, I'm sending you an invite. And so I got an invite from Larry's like, all right, you know, I'll try it out. And, uh, you know, we sat down and, you know, the first episode was basically us talking about what are we going to podcast about, right? Um, and, it, you know, it sort of kind of, it's kind of stuck. I think we just uh, finished our sixth or fifth episode, um, you know, uh, today, in fact. And, uh, you know, it's been fun and we're learning a lot and uh, we're hoping to learn some from you guys who've done, you know, 240 plus. You guys have been doing it for you know, five years and, and we're, um, excited to, you know, to learn from some experienced folks like, like yourself. Cool. Very cool. Um, one of the things you guys have talked about a number of times on, on your show, um, you know, as you were building, as you were building uh, Bizzo, um, was, I mean, you guys got started with AWS really early, like the 2007, 2008 timeframe. And, you know, back then there was there was very little uh, in terms of services. There was uh, S3 and EC2, and you know maybe one other service that was there. Um, give us a sense of like how things evolved for you guys from you know figuring out when to start using a new service, um, when to determine like oh well we already sort of built the thing internally, and then AWS turned it into a service, and should we swap over to that service? So just any sort of kind of historical content you can give us because I think it helps people. Everybody knows AWS as being, you know, this, this humongous thing full of services now, but uh, give us a sense of how you guys evolved in, in using, you know, just a few services to, to a lot of services. Yeah, it's an interesting question. I think, um, and it is hard. I think, well, you know, one of the things when you start that early 2008, it's, you end up with legacy things, right? Where you build all the stuff, you know, pre IAM, pre uh, EMR, pre Kinesis, pre SNS, pre SQS, you know, Pre, pre, pre VPC, right? Yeah, pre VPC was a big one, and so oh, wow. yeah, yeah, it, it can be hard. It can be hard to, and you know, in fact, I remember early on, you know, we're talking to different people and uh, different companies, like years, like even years ago, right? And they said, "Well, the easiest way to move to VPC is to just start a new database account," <laughs> you know, because VPC by default uh, and the VPC, VPC by default is different than you know setting up a VPC, but. You know, so it can be hard to have all this legacy stuff and, you know, how do you adopt even new AWS things, let alone, you know, other clouds. But, um, yeah, it, it's one of those things. It's easy to think about, like, well, if we're starting today, how would things look? But actually making that transition, you know, can be hard. And uh, definitely envy people starting today versus people that started, you know, 2008. It's definitely a lot easier to get going, a lot more blocks to, to use. Yeah, I, I think I'll answer that question more of like, you know, as a developer, you know, from a developer mindset, not not necessarily from a professional standpoint, but like, you know, I think in, in learning actually, we were talking about this earlier today, you know, look at the other clouds and, um, you know, I, I think, you know, obviously you've got AWS, who's number one, you've got, uh, you know, uh, Azure, just number two from a revenue standpoint and, and Google number three, right? Um, and, you know, I think, you know, AWS is a clear lead from a revenue standpoint. And, and the, the question is, how, how do these other t- clouds really compete? Um, you know, uh, Brian, you said you're out at the Google Cloud um, conference saying, I'd love to hear your thoughts. But, um, you know, one of the things that Larry and I were talking about was the, the announcement of the Google Cloud um, Vision API. And the and, um, that was a, a little while ago, but then also the uh, Cloud Speech API that they announced, I think, this week. And, you know, what's interesting about those two things in particular, those two APIs in particular, I think, are the fact that um, those are really, you know, differentiated from, from the AWS offerings, right? AWS has like the machine learning um, API, but they don't have anything that's sort of like super deep learning, um, hardcore AI based API that, you um, you know, and, and I think those two things are really strengths, uh, you know, that, you know, that sort of deep learning machine sort of big amounts of data stuff is, is very um, strategically uh, kind of powerful position for Google. And so for, um, you know, like for just me as a developer, like that's a really exciting thing and, and definitely 
makes me want to um, look into those APIs more. Um, and maybe I'm still running on AWS proper for most things, but like I'm, I'm now really thinking about how do I use those APIs, which, you know, is a good thing for Google. Yeah, Donnie, I mean, I, I tend to agree with you. Um, I mean, that was the thing that jumped out at me and, and probably impressed me most about the, the Google Next event was, was all the things around uh, big data and machine learning, um, you know, le- less, you know, they got beat up a little bit for, you know, lack of some of the, the underlying building blocks and people want to compare them to AWS. And, um, you know, that's obviously natural since, like you said, AWS is, is, is leading. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think you know, the, the thing that kind of jumped out at me, if I put myself in a customer's perspective, there were a number of companies uh, like Coca-Cola, for example, um, where, you know, they're trying to become more digital. They're trying to do some new things. And, you know, how to go about doing that isn't completely known. So, you know, when, when you're you, trying to figure out how to, how to do something really different um, and you've got some of these higher level tools, these super intelligent tools, like some of the machine learning stuff, vision API, speech API, uh, you know, all those sort of cognitive things. Um, I think that's going to become a really interesting thing for maybe, you know, developers will have a, a play in there, obviously, uh, cause they're going to, they're going to put it together. But I think for, um, you know, at a more sort of artistic level, creative level, you can start to go, well, what if, and, um, and that'll be a powerful, powerful thing, differentiator for Google. Um, it'll be interesting to see how they market it and see how they turn it into, uh, into real applications with customers. Yeah, no, that makes sense. Hey, so, so let me, let me ask you guys this. We've talked a good bit about, um, Lambda or really the, actually more the concept of serverless recently. And for those that are out there, so, so help, help us understand the basics of, of Lambda, you know, there's lots of tutorials and books out there and, but, but kind of give us a walkthrough uh, or an example of, of what a, a typical, um, use case and architecture would look like. And then, I don't know, maybe we'll go into, to, a you know, in a, uh, engineers and coffee fashion, we'll go into a will it Lambda free, you know, freaky concept I'll throw at you guys as well. But let's, <laughs> let's start it with the basics. Yeah, so this is tricky. I think honestly, this is something that you know we're still trying to wrap our heads around, which I think is was also part of the reason for the Wilt Lambda to try and think. You know, if you're not used to thinking about apps in this way, it can be kind of hard to shift your mindset, mind sh- your mindset to you know um, architecting in this way. So I think it's useful to try and see, you know, can you do it? But you know, for me, I think you know your your episode on serverless with um, I think it was Joe Emerson. You know, I think he had a lot of great. Um, sort of thoughts on this in terms of, you know, kind of outsourcing your SLA and your uptime and just focusing on the core business logic. And to me, I think that's what Lambda is all about, right? It's about, you're really just writing the core business logic and you're not really worrying about um, updating the machines. You know, if there's, if there's a security fix for Ubuntu, you don't really have to worry about it. Amazon is taking care of it. And you're really just focusing on the core business logic. Um, so that's part of it. You know, the other part that's really interesting to me about Lambda is the shift, I think, also with an AWS to moving to kind of more event-based uh, things, right? So things like the AWS config rules where whenever your AWS configuration changes, if a machine starts or, you know, stops or anything happens, eventually you'll, you'll get some kind of event that you can process with Lambda. And I think... You know, maybe this is a separate thing, but I think this opens up a whole new way of thinking about sort of concerns of applications, almost like an AOP model where as a developer, maybe you don't really have to think so much about, say, security or, you know, compliance because, you know, the security team or the compliance team, they can write these kind of standard functions that anytime a machine starts up, it'll run a function to make sure, hey, is this machine running, you know, latest X or is this resource tag properly for billing or whatever. And so as a developer, you just do the simplest thing possible, start, you know, a machine or make a dynamo table. And behind the scenes, you have this logic that's operating on every single resource. And I think that event-based architecture, and it's still coming because, you know, there's not events for a ton of things. The events that there are, um, you know, is a little smaller, but I think it's, uh, it's an obvious thing. I think it's definitely coming and I think that'll be a really big shift. So maybe that was a little bit of a sidetrack, but um, you know, in general, I think the nice thing about Lambda is just running really small contained pieces of code um, with core business logic and kind of tying them together. And, you know, of course, there's a lot of, <laughs> it's not all, you know, upside. There's, there is a lot of, I think, uh, management that comes along with that and that can be tricky. And I think 
for sure, I think the tools haven't really caught up with that yet. Um, you know, like it's hard enough really to kind of manage existing, say, I am roles for, you know, your apps. And we think about like a Lambda based uh, API gateway application where every single path could potentially be a different function with its own deployment and its own security rules around it. That's a lot to manage. And I think that, you know, the tooling really hasn't caught up with, with that yet. So, you know, it's still super early days, but I think exciting. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in. I, so just full disclosure, I am, uh, I'm advising uh, the serverless framework. Um, so, you know, go check it out. It's, it's actually, you know, one of the sort of many frameworks out there now um, for, for sort of spinning up Lambda and, uh, you know, Lambda apps. Right. But um, I'll, I'll go back and like, you know, I, I sort of talked about this on our podcast, but I think one of the most important things to me about the cloud and, and sort of like u- utilizing the cloud, um, correctly um, is building auto-scaled apps, right? So, you know, making your application sort of scale up and down based on traffic. Um, yeah, you know, I think it's just a really good uh, practice. And what it does is it forces you to build super robust, you know, sort of like containers or, in, you know, images and sort of pack, package up your software in a way so that you're assuming that your apps, you know, can go up and down, right? So it forces you to sort of build stateless um you know, uh, servers. And I think with Lambda, you know, so, so maybe before I get there, but I think the thing about, um, auto scaling, building auto scaling apps on top of EC2, um, in particular is that it's actually really hard, right? Um, there's a lot of tooling that we built internally, um, you know, to be able to make it easier to deploy applications, uh, auto scaling groups, like set up ELBs, do that in a very, sort of um, easy, easy to manage way for, you know, for our developers. Right. Um, but, you know, I would, I would love to see the numbers here. I, I would argue that probably most people aren't really taking advantage, full advantage of the auto scaling um, stuff that AWS has to offer. And it's because it's a really hard thing to operate. And so I look at Lambda as, you know, this amazing, like, you know, it auto scales for you. It takes away all the operational overhead, which, you know, with the cloud is, is lower than sort of with data centers, but there's still overhead there. Um, and it just uh, reduces it so much further, right, to essentially nothing, right? You write your, your business logic um, and, you know, obviously that can be the most simple thing. And, you know, Lambda is, is all about sort of functional programming, right? You're just writing a function, um, takes an input, you know, has an output and um, lets you deploy that and operate that um, so much easier. Uh, and I think to me, that's like the most important thing. It's sort of the productivity side, um, for our, de- all your developers just goes through the roof, right? They're just writing pure logic, um, versus operating things. And I think that, that to me is part of the exciting, um, thing for serverless apps in general, and, um, you know, Lambda in particular on AWS. You guys have used this uh, sort of concept or thrown something out to your audience where you say like, you know, hey, will it Lambda, right? Kind of playing off that. Um, any any just sort of good starter things you found as, as you're experimenting with, with some of the serverless stuff or with Lambda or, um, you know, even at any of the other services, like anything that's just, uh, you know, almost, you know, a little beyond a hello world type of thing that's, that's good for people to think about it, like ways to think about it? I think, I, I mean, I, I think... Um... For me, there's, you know, I, I think it's always easier to start with something really simple, right? Um, so, you know, and, and maybe sort of talk about w- what's hot right now, right? There's a lot of bots being talked about, right? Um, and, you know, if you sort of break down building a bot, all you're talking about is like you're getting some text from, you know, user and you're, you know, acting on that text and returning some response, right? I mean, you can, that's basically any app, right? Like that's a web app as well, right? You're getting a request from some, you know, some client out there, you're, you know, querying a database or doing whatever, and you're, you know, you're sending a response back. And so, I mean, I think that's the, the, you know, the most basic, um, you know, if you sort of boil down most web web applications or client applications, um, you know, chat applications, uh, you know, even uh, you can build, you know, Alexa apps now, right? Like, it, all it is is just like you're getting some input and you're returning some output and um, and or you're, you know, you're pro- like, I think Larry's got a great example too, where you're just, you're processing events, right? And you may not even be returning any output in that case. 
Um, but it's like the mo- it's it's sort of the most basic building block to any application is you know you just write a function and uh, you know in order to like build a web app you have to wrap that you know simple function in all this other stuff right you have to like process HTTP and you know like you have to at a you know higher level like you know or if you're you're building um, a chat application you have to like you know, connect it with some chat application somewhere. So, so I think what what's to me, it's all about like, you know, take something really simple that you want to build for yourself, right? Whether it's a little app, a little web app, um, start or start with something that, you know, um, you have domain knowledge on whether it's writing web apps or chat apps or, you know, mobile apps or whatever, and just try to write a hello world app on top of that, where you're, you know, you're pinging, you're pinging Lambda right? You're, you're, you know, you're putting like API gateway or something in front of Lambda. And, and then I think you get it. And it's such a low barrier to entry. Like any one of us could write a Lambda based app in, you know, 15 minutes. Right. And, and I think that's the, that's what it might take for a lot of people to sort of get the simplicity and the, you know, sort of amazing, like, wow moment for, for, for Lambda and for serverless apps in general, I think. Um, You know, on your show, Donnie has mentioned a number of times, um, and you guys have probably both mentioned it, you know, kind of this affinity for using more and more of the AWS services or really any of the, you know, cloud as a service services. Um, you know, essentially it's this uh, sort of eliminate all the unnecessary lifting, focus on going fast mentality. Um, you know, you guys obviously were a startup at one point, but like, how did you kind of come to that? Cause you, you know, you've talked before about like, Hey, we built our own internal Hadoop. Um, and then, you know, the sort of Hadoop as a service came along. So, you know, how do you, how do you, go, you know, go about kind of getting into that mindset and, you know, is this, is that mindset also applicable for, for non-startup companies? Um, <laughs> you want to take a shot, Larry? <laughs> okay. Yeah. I don't know. It's, it's tough. I mean, I think, you know, it's one of these things I don't know. It's hard to sort of like prove the the negative of it or, or prove that it's the way to go. But you know, if 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 you want to be kind of customer focused and bring value to customers, then you need to work on things that that bring value and differentiate, right? And I think you know, it's I'm I used to one of my first jobs out of school was working at Dow Jones, and someone there told me that at a certain point, you know, Dow Jones they published the Wall Street Journal. Um, they decided it'd be a good idea to get into like the paper business because <laughs> they use a lot of paper. So they built their own paper mill. Right. And that's, that's kind of crazy. And I think this is one of those things. If you, if you are some company and you're, and you're t- telling your customers and your employees and your shareholders, like, Hey, you know, we think we can produce power, you know, faster, cheaper, better than the power company. Like they would think you're, you're nuts, you know? And I think that same kind of thing is going to be when people think about, you know, computing um, as, you know, really this, um, uh, kind of commodity um, resource. And, you know, we talked a little bit about the Dropbox move. They built their own um, kind of data center to house other data. And, you know, we don't know the details. We've never worked at Dropbox. I don't know anyone that works there, but there's this huge article and it, it doesn't really mention why it's better for anyone. And in fact, it says that customers will never notice, you know, and I guess that's kind of good when you have a bit a big change in your infrastructure, you don't want to be outages. But the fact that customers never notice I think to me, it has to question, well, why did you spend, you know, two years and dozens of engineers and how much money building something that literally has no effect for customers? Yeah, no, I, I, you know, your, your point about, um, you know, Dropbox basically saying, hey, this is going to be uh, transparent to customers is is really interesting. Uh, I think that's, you know, that kind of puts a, puts a bow on it. I mean, if, if customers aren't going to see the difference. Why are you doing it? And, um, you know, I'm sure there is some reason for it, but, but that really is a, is an interesting way of looking at it. No, no, because I think it's just so much work. And if you even look at like, I mean, how would you build AWS? Right. Um, you know, Google and Google and Microsoft are trying really hard, spending billions of dollars trying to do it. And, you know, AWS is already like 16 X revenue of, uh, of, of Google. So I think it'd be really hard. Um, yeah. yeah and, I, you, and you bring up an interesting point there. So we had a, I don't know if you guys follow him or not, but a, a guy on the podcast, uh, it's been a while. We need to get Simon back on, but Simon Wardley, and, and he talks a lot about um, the models behind all of this. And 
even years ago, he was kind of saying, look, there's never going to be uh, more than a few big public clouds for exactly the reasons you just oh, talked yeah. about. It just takes too much money to to stay on top of the game at this point. Uh, and in and engineering effort, right? Like exactly. it's not it, like so the the economies of scale that Amazon is, you know, sort of starting to benefit from and you know, and there's only a very few number of companies. I mean with not only the the money, but also the engineering capabilities, right? Um, to pull off sort of this public cloud thing. And uh, I mean, the three sort of ones that we see, right, um, that are at the top, um, you know, Amazon, Microsoft, and Google are the, are really the only ones can do it. I know there are other cl- companies that are trying to get into it, right? Like Oracle and, and there's sort of like kind of some alternative clouds like, uh, you know, digital uh, ocean, right? Um, some super cheap, you know, trying to be like super cheap stuff. But um, I think, you know, I, I totally, I'm, you know, Larry and I are 100% on the same page. It's it's all about, um, and maybe I'll go even more, more generic, it's all about innovation, right? It's all about time to market and how fast can you get more uh, innovation to your customers? Like, you know, uh, who's a, I can't remember who said this, but basically somebody said that, you know, tech, tech is all about, you know, successful tech companies are, are ones that are continuously putting out innovation faster and faster. Right. And so unless you're investing in innovation, I think Dropbox, you know, again, I don't know too much about these, but I think it's a good, a good sort of case study. You know, they put all this time and effort, two years of stuff and, you know, they're get they're like in a super ultra competitive space. You know, everybody's coming into storage. It's such a commodity thing. Google you've got Box going after the enterprise. Um, and they spent all this engineering effort just to you know save money on storage. When to me, it seems more like an existential you know problem that they they may be facing in a few years. And, and I think for so that's you know they're a bit larger, so maybe they're more focused on the bottom line. Um, but for startups. You know, it's all about finding product market fit and that, um, you know, sort of time to market from an innovation to finding market fit. Um, you're not going to be able to do that building, you know, building anything yourself. And I think, um, you know, it's I think you're also starting to see I and mean, we did a, a, one of our podcasts. We talked a little bit about this. You're starting to see some of these bigger, uh, more established companies that don't really want to be in the data center business like you know the big banks are now talking about how do we move some of our stuff over to you know google and you know and uh aws and i'm sure microsoft is in the mix as well so i think it's um to me it's it's how much um you have to have you know the money but you also have the engineering prowess and you have to be you know ask yourself what are we going to give up in terms of customer you know uh innovation in, in order to um, you know, sort of do all of this ourselves. Guys, this has been a lot of fun. Thank you so much for being on tonight. Uh, you know, folks, like we said, definitely go check out the uh, Engineers Coffee, uh, Engineers and Coffee, Engineers.Coffee podcast. We'll have all the, the details in the show notes. But uh, guys, thank you so much for being on tonight. It's been a lot of fun. Yeah, totally. Aaron, I think that's going to wrap it up for tonight. You want to take us home? Thank you for listening to The Cloudcast. Please visit thecloudcast.net to find more shows, show notes, videos, and everything social media.